Okay, so today we'll be dealing with a little excerpt of The Communist Manifesto by Karl Marx and Friedrich Engels. Uh, this is a really interesting uh, piece of work. Uh, it's one that we have to be careful with not to take the wrong way. Um, because a lot of times we just hear that word communist or communism or anything like that, and we get really wrapped up in all of our 20th century notions of its evilness and all of that. Um, but this thing was published in 1848, so that sort of idea had uh, didn't quite have the same baggage with it that we have. So don't get too wrapped up in that word. Just sort of consider the big ideas uh, that Marx and Engels bring up. Um, these two people were working together, although later in his life Engels gave most of the credit to Marx, and Marx is the one who we uh, know most famously today. But, you know, Engels definitely played his role as well. Uh, the selection that we're going to be talking about is roughly a quarter of the book, uh, just the preamble in chapter one. There are four chapters of the book, but uh, chapter one is sort of the, you know, significant foundation it's built around this main big idea here, right, where it says the history of all hitherto existing society is the history of class struggles. Okay, so it's basically just positing this idea that um, there are the rich and there are the ones who are not rich. There are the ones who are in control. There are the ones who are subjugated. Uh, and that the clashes and conflicts between these people have basically shaped um, all of history. Um, many of the things that Marx and Engels bring up here are truly interesting uh, and fascinating, and they are just as relevant today and just as applicable today in our era of you know income distribution problems and the one percent and all of these types of things uh, as they were back when uh, Marx wrote them. Um, so there are some interesting things. One of the big things that uh, that we need to understand are these two words that Marx is throwing around all the time, uh, bourgeois or bourgeoisie and proletariat. Um, these words, you know, being long sort of lumpy words need definitions so that we can understand them more fully. Um, later, years after this was published, uh, Engels came up with really good definitions for both of them. Uh, bourgeois as being the class of modern capitalists, owners of the means of social production and employers of wage labor. Okay, so the bourgeoisie, these are the people who own the businesses and pay other people to do the work. Okay, the proletariat are the class of modern wage laborers who, having no means of production of their own, are reduced to selling their labor power in order to live. So these are all the people who basically are the, the paycheck garnering schlubs. Okay, so you can sort of see, like in today's world, you have the, the bourgeoisie who are the ones who own the corporations, right? And then there are the proletariat who work in the factories or work in the cubicles, you know? So th this sort of dynamic is still alive and well today. It's not something that has gone anywhere. Um, there are a lot of big ideas in this uh, little piece that we have here. Um, one I want to bring up is this idea of free trade. Marx says, in place of the numberless indefeasible chartered freedoms has set up that single unconscionable freedom, free trade. So he's basically saying that in a sense, this capitalism, you know, this bourgeois versus uh, proletarian interest uh, has set up a situation in which free trade is really the only freedom that we have and that freedom in other regards um, are, are not as important. And you still see that in the political realm today. We don't want to get too political because it could get ugly in a hurry. Um, but in a sense, there is that whole entire class of people out there who are all about free trade in the markets, um, yet they maybe uh, have hesitation about people having other sorts of freedoms, like the freedom to marry who they please or the freedom to do the drugs that they want or the freedom to have firearms. You know, So you see it crosses Democrat-Republican lines in this American context because you know the, the capitalist perspective um, of free trade having primacy sort of uh, overlaps the interests of both typical you know, right-wing and left-wing individuals. Some other things that it brings up are this issue of globalization, which I think is really fascinating. It says, in place of the old wants satisfied by the production of the country, we find new wants requiring for their satisfaction the products of distant lands and climes. 
Uh, and then it says, the cheap prices of commodities are the heavy artillery which, with which it batters down all Chinese walls, with which it forces the barbarians' intensely obstinate hatred of foreigners to capitulate. Um, so basically, what it's sort of getting at is that this sort of, uh, you know, capitalist, you know, continued production ends up resulting in us uh, wanting and needing things that maybe we didn't even know existed before. Um, so that's sort of an, in, an interesting thing. When you have globalization, you develop desires and wants for things that before wouldn't have even been an option. Like, for example, you know, you can live in the northern United States or in Canada, and you can develop a want and a desire to eat oranges. Well, before you know, globalization, you wouldn't even have the option to have had an orange, right? Because they don't grow up there. Um, but now we do have this desire. So there's this creation of an increasing want. Um, also, there's the idea that with globalization, even barbarian nations, to use that offensive term, um, you know, nations that aren't civilized according to the Western paradigm of expectation, um, they have to sort of do what Western nations and what the capitalist machine wants uh, in order to sort of keep up, you know, otherwise they fall behind, right? So these are some of the, the big ideas that are brought up here. Another one that's interesting is the idea of the, the proletarian and the proletariat, uh, you know, population sort of being subjugated, that because they are just having to use their labor uh, to earn money, they aren't able to earn money off of products necessarily, uh, is that the things that they once upon a time uh, maybe would have gotten great satisfaction from uh, laboring over. Now they just have to sort of mass produce it. It says, modern industry has converted the little workshop of the master into the great factory of the industrial capitalists. Uh, and it says, not only are the bourgeoisie slaves of the bourge or the, the proletariat, not only are they slaves of the bourgeois class and of the bourgeois state, they are daily and hourly enslaved by the machine, by the overlooker, and above all, by the individual manufacturer himself. Um, so with this idea, it's sort of like, you know, you imagine the person who's uh, working at McDonald's, okay? That's like a classic sort of proletariat uh, type of individual, uh, is that this person working at McDonald's, they're enslaved by the machines that they have to work with and create, they're enslaved by the products, they're enslaved by the overlook or their manager who's telling them what to do all the time, and more than anything, they're enslaved by McDonald's. Okay, that this thing that they sort of are in this sort of serfdom uh, to this corporate interest where somebody else is getting rich uh, off of their labor. So you can see lots of big ideas here. Um, this as a social science type of work. It's not, again, something that, you know, maybe we want to become overtly political about, but there definitely are these dynamics uh, out in the world. One other thing it talks about is that basically once the piece starts to get a little bit more edgy, uh, is that it says that the, the bourgeoisie, because they must elicit uh, the proletariat uh, for acceptance and, you know, for votes and things like this, that in a sense, the bourgeoisie are actually arming the proletariat so that they will eventually be able to rise up in revolution and beat them. Um, one thing that's interesting is that it, it suggests that increased communication is sort of the you know engine that will fuel this. It says, this union is helped on by the improved means of communication that are created by modern industry and that place the workers of different localities in contact with one another. It makes you wonder what Marx would have thought of the internet. He would have thought that this is a great thing, you know, for organizing individuals to rise against uh, the leaders, uh, in a sense. And you saw things like that in the Arab Spring, where individuals would use things like Twitter um, and text messages to communicate with each other to try to rebel against the government. So that's the type of thing that, that he was talking about there. So a couple other really big things that I that I want to bring up in regards to this. One is in regards to uh, minority movements. Uh, he says all previous historical movements were movements of minorities or in the interest of minorities. And you think about that and you're like, huh, we usually consider minorities to be, you know, historically subjugated people in our sort of modern context. That is exactly not the way that Marx is talking about. Marx is talking about the idea of movements of minorities to serve minorities being uh, a royal family 
that's a minority, right? It's a small amount of people. This, this, you know, like a kingdom or, you know, some sort of dictator or, you know, a fiefdom or, you know, a knight or any of these circumstances are basically one in which you have a minority group of people who are trying to control things and take things over, over the majority. Um, the thing that Marx proposes is that the proletarian movement is the self-conscious independent movement of the immense majority. So he actually, you know, is in favor of this sort of majority rule uh, that you get when the pro proletariat is in control, when the people who, you know, work desk jobs, when the people who, you know, make your fries, when the people who fix your car, you know, when basically anyone who does not own a corporation, right, anyone who is not like a, you know, wealthy business owner, that this is the majority that should have power. And he sort of concludes this idea uh, in this chapter by suggesting that armed revolution is the only way. Uh, it says, in depicting the most general phases of the development of the proletariat, we trace the more or less veiled civil war raging within existing society up to the point where that war breaks out into open revolution and where the violent overthrow of the bourgeoisie lays the foundation. Okay, so this is where things start getting dicey. This is where you start to see the hints of how the Communist Manifesto, written in the mid-19th century, ends up leading to things like uh, Maoism and the Stalinist regime and these various other you know, communist elements of the 20th century that were very brutal you know, for this idea of overthrowing the power and using violence to do it. Um, so... Problematic. It even says what the bourgeoisie therefore produces above all are its own grave diggers. So there are some, you know, tough sort of violent ideas here. Um, but despite that, um, I think that there are just in terms of social science, a lot of really astute observations about the nature of, you know, the, those in control, the haves and haves not, have nots, uh, about uh, globalization, about the nature of communication, you know, that all of these things, that the advancing of technology, these are all things that are really compelling and interesting here. Um, it even ends, the manifesto itself ends with the famous line, working men of all countries unite, uh, that you know, we need to unite against those people who are just sort of sitting there you know, drinking cocktails and you know, letting the money roll in. Um, so there is lots of interesting stuff. But uh, the reason why this text is romantic, I think, is sort of interesting because it does have many of those sort of romantic uh, signs to it. You know, it's it's all about the idea of, you know, revolution and change and democracy and, you know, unifying individuals and all of this sort of stuff. Of course, it's not necessarily about, you know, contemplating on the nature of God and the nature of nature or, uh, you know, about these sort of, you know, maybe more typically pleasant ideas. Um, but in terms of how it wants to bring human beings together uh, to sort of for a greater good, it might not necessarily suggest the greatest route to do that, um, but it definitely does uh, have some astute observations.